God is so good to us. Get your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. You know, uh, after a, a British Airways flight, after British Airways flight had reached its cruising altitude, the captain announced, Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain. Welcome to Flight 293, non-stop from London Heathrow to Toronto. The, the weather ahead is good. We should have a smooth, uneventful flight, so sit back and relax. Oh, my God! A scream and silence followed. Some minutes later, the captain came back on the intercom and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I scared you. While I was talking to you, a flight attendant accidentally spilled a cup of coffee in my lap. He said, You should see the front of my pants. One of the passengers said, Yeah, we're good to say you see the back of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was on a flight, and I think the, 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 the pilot forgot to turn his, turn his intercom off. And I weren't too happy with what I was hearing either. Okay. Get your Bibles out. Stand for the reading of the Word. We're, we're going to do something that's going to be, <coughs> be, be, be different today. This is different. Of course, we've been doing a lot of different stuff, but this is going to be probably different. Very different. Matter of fact, let me just ask you something. Does anybody... You ain't got to raise your hands, but but this is if you've been dealing with some kind of a loss or some kind of change, or maybe your life has taken a course that you weren't expecting, or things just went different than what you had planned. I mean, we all go through that every day, but sometimes it's just so major, it's just hard to, to get through it. And so uh, this is actually, and I'm preaching to myself too because I'm dealing with Bethany's death, and so so so. Uh, just the Lord just dealt with me about this, and so I wanted to share it with everybody else because I believe honestly that this will really, really do something for you. It's a two-parter, so this is today is the first part. Next week's going to be, uh, I think, even even better. First Samuel, chapter sixteen. If you don't know where First Samuel is, it's right before Second Samuel. First Samuel sixteen, verse one. <clears throat> And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. As he said, I have provided. In other words, he's saying, I still got everything under control. Don't, don't, just because things are going haywire, I still got it under control. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. Here's some anxiety. Again, <clears throat> there was anxiety because of what he heard about Saul. <clears throat> now there's anxiety because of what God's telling him to do. And the Lord said, take a heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him who I named unto thee. Stretch forth your hands this way. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your touch. I thank you for your power. I thank you for your anointing. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch and anoint in such a way that we'll know, God, that you're in this place. And God, touch in a way, Lord, that you can heal hearts. God, we can't do it. None of us have that ability. But you do. Your Holy Spirit is in the midst of us right now. Help us, God, to realize, again, like I said earlier, it's not by an empty seat. It's not the seats can be empty. The parking lot can be empty. Edward can be empty. That's not what stops you. It's when our hearts are empty. That's what stops you. God, help my heart to be hungry for you. Help our hearts to be hungry for you. And to see what you've got for us right now. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, let healing. If it's already started, let it get further. And if it hadn't started, let it start right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. 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 You can be seated on the way down. Give somebody a high five, low five, low five, and say, if you're not here after what I'm here after, you'll be here after I'm gone. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, fill your horn with oil and go. Now, now you got to understand that when when the prophet had had his horn, uh, what it was, it was a it was a ram's horn. This 
this ram's horn was hollowed out and he had anointing oil in this. And so when he was going to go do pray for people, when he was going to do anointing uh, before battle, all these things, when he went, he was to put his put, fill up his horn with oil and go. Now he's, he's going through a bad time. Let me, let me just kind of just shoot one thing right here to start with. Is when we think about this story that I'm getting ready to read to you, there, there's usually two lessons uh, in this on David's call. Of course, if we talk about David all the time, we're not talking about David right now. We're going to talk about Samuel. We're not even talking about Saul to this big extent. We're going to talk about Samuel. Okay, because Samuel's in between these guys. Samuel is the one guy they all got in common. Samuel. All right? There's people in your life right now, there might be sides against sides in, in your family. This side of the family is against that side of the family, or you got this people at work, they won't talk, these people over here won't talk, and you're the one in the middle. You're the one caught in the middle. You're the one that's having to bear the load on both sides, and you're trying to, 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 to take care of business. And so that's what Samuel was doing. Samuel is the middleman. And whether you know or not, some of y'all in here right now are middlemen. I didn't say little men. I said middlemen. Amen? You're, 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 God's got you in a position that you don't even realize just how much he's got riding on you. All right? You're the middleman. Somebody say, I think I'm a middleman. All right. Okay. But here we're going to talk about David's calling. I love this. First thing you see about David's call is uh, you can't judge a book by its cover. He's a little bitty fellow. And he was a shepherd. And also, dynamite comes in small packages. They, they, they actually uh, dug him up uh, because of something. They excavated his, his remains, and he was only like five foot two. This little fella. You see a five foot two guy taking care of a giant? Five foot two, five foot three. I mean, that's just a, that. I mean, he was not a great big guy. Of course, Saul was hitting shoulders above everybody. So Saul looked like, you know, it would be like Bruce Lee and, and Jabbar. Remember that movie where they were in the same movie? And here's Bruce Lee and here's Jabbar. That, that's Saul and there's David. Okay, so but the focus today again is on Samuel, the middle man. All right? That, now, that, 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 he, he's having a hard time, a very hard time. You see, because Samuel did not realize to begin with, and now he's learning that he's actually uh, living in a, 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 a mode of, of uh, transition. And of course, uh, he had blown it. Uh, Saul had blown it. Saul, there was a great call on Saul's life. Saul was called to be the king. But now, call and with, with, with a call, when God calls you for something, there's an anointing always to match what he's called you to do. So I want you to think about it today. If you're called to be a middleman, then there's an anointing to match that that you're called to do. Although it's hard, it's, you've you got that anointing to take care of it. But not only was he anointed, he had a great fall. And so now, because he had this great fall, he's still in office, but God's getting ready to remove him when the time is right. And so, so, so watch this now. <clears throat> in Samuel's life, as he watched this with Saul, how he was trying to help this man, how to push him along, help him, care for him, be God's contact for him, talk to God for him. The middleman, there's an unexpected end. God finally says one day, with Saul, enough's enough. Okay, that's it. I'm taking him out of office. It's over. He said, but before it can be taken out, I'm not just going to take him out. There's got to be somebody to take his place. And so there was an unexpected end. He thought God was going to keep on giving grace, keep on giving grace, keep on giving grace. And so God said, okay, grace is gone. Now, now, so now there's this unexpected season in Saul in Samuel's life. Samuel didn't know that now he's going to go through this morning, this grief process. Now, some of us right now, we're not like, we don't have a saw in our life that actually displeased God and, and God took him away. Some of us, it was a job that we had. It was a family member. Uh, it was a relationship that we had. Maybe it's just something in our own health. But something that we had that we thought would be there, unlimited. And now it's taken away. Again, I told you last week, Bethany, I keep the rings in my head every, every, every day. Bethany said one of the last things she said before she couldn't talk again or couldn't talk is she looked over at Daniel in D.C. and she said, I thought I had more time. Wow. So, so I think about that. I hear it all the time. I thought I had more time. And so, so again, Bethany, even Bethany, she, she's 27. She didn't 
know that she was going to be dying at 27. So, so, so again, so now, now I'm thrown into a season of mourning for her. She's great. She's having a wonderful time with God, you know. But, but, but so there's that season. So maybe the season you're having a mourning because you lost a job or lost a relationship or, or, or whatever, because it takes all kinds of things can happen in your life and throw you in mourning. And, and so, so not only was there an unexpected mourning for Sam, but there was an unexpected beginning. You know, it's really kind of wild uh, uh, what we know in this season or this time of, of transition. So watch this. Samuel, this is so awesome. Samuel actually, uh, uh, in his life now, he, he's about to go and learn a new king. This new king's going to step on the scene, but Samuel's about to discover some things. You know, as I look at Saul, when Saul was chosen to be king, Samuel tried to talk him out of it. You don't need a king. We don't need a, a well, you've got a theocracy. You don't need a monarchy. You've got a theocracy, and, which is when God's in control. And they said, no, we want to have a king be like everybody else. And he said, well, it's going to make it hard on you. He's going to take your kids and draft them. He's going to take your money. He's going to build the armies and all the stuff he's going to do. But they still wanted a king, so he goes and gets Saul. Saul is head and shoulders, literally head and shoulders above everybody in Israel. He looked the part of a king. If you read up until he starts falling down, if you read, the man had a good attitude. He was modest. There were some good things about Saul when he first started out. It was awesome. So he looked the part of a king. He was handsome. He, he was tall. He, he had a good attitude about him. He was just really an awesome guy. And so he looked like a king. But over the years, that all kind of was taken away because he just began to change. And so now... God's getting ready to not only level the playing field, God's going to change the playing field. God's got Samuel with his position, the middleman. And he's not just bringing changes in a new king, but he's going to bring a change in how the king is even picked and how the king is even going to look because Saul looked the part of a king. David was a short fellow. Oh, he looked good, but he was a little short fellow. He was a shepherd. He just did not look like a king. Matter of fact, his dad didn't even think that he was even worthy to be called when Samuel goes in to get his sons to anoint them. He doesn't even call David in because he doesn't think David's even worthy enough to be called in to be anointed by Samuel. And so, so it's a time of transition. But God's giving me to do something so special. It would bog your mind to think about it. Some of us in here right now, we're the middle men, and we're, we're, we're hurting, and, and we're carrying the burden for both sides, and we're carrying that, that hurt and that pain. But one thing I tell you, remember, there's a great anointing with that great call. There's a great anointing with that great call. Also, if you hold on, God's getting ready not only to level the playing field. God's going to change the playing field. Look at somebody and say, change is coming. Good change. Good change. So, so, so here we are. He's here, and, and he's getting ready to go anoint David uh, as king. Now, now, when the transition comes, it's change, but also it seems like there's chances that you have to take. Of course, we call it walking by faith, but the world calls it chances. So now, in this transition, there's some heavy, heavy stuff, because when the transition comes, there's going to be change. Some of the change is positive. Some of the change is negative. I can sit back and think about it in my own life. I'll sit back when, when, when transition comes and I look and I'm thinking, wow, this is some powerful stuff. This is awesome. And then I turn the page, so to speak, and I find out, whoa, this is not so awesome after all. And it's kind of like you get your baby, you think it's awesome, and you can't wait to be a daddy, and now you're a daddy, and then 3 o'clock in the morning, your wife won't get up, says, you get up and take care. And you get up and there's a diaper had been on that baby. That diaper's now in, walled over in, the, the, uh, in, the, in the, the crib. And that baby's got in that stuff. And you're looking down there and thinking, you can't be coming from my loins. <laughs> it was DC. It was DC. Okay. DC thought he was an artist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you look at this stuff. For every positive, 
positive in that change, there's going to be some negative. But for every negative, look at it this way. I can look at it as for every positive, there's going to be negatives. Or I can look at it that in every negative, there's going to be some positives. Because it's both coming. They're both going to be there. When the change comes, there's going to be positive and negative. And you have to learn how to deal with both of them. And at the same time, you can you juggle them at the same exact time. But not only is there a change, there's anxiety. Because there's positive and there's negative. A lot of times there's anxiety for, for one person. But a lot of times once the middleman starts to do what he's anointed to do and starts reaching out. You see, let me tell you something. If you're a middleman right now and you're standing in between, who does this remind you? Jesus than you've ever been when you're a middleman. When you're grabbing both sides. Whether it be at work, whether it be with your family, whether it be wherever, you're more like Jesus. So watch this now. Watch. So there's anxiety for one, there's anxiety for all, but you have to learn how to cope with this and how to get beyond this. So let me just let me just show you this. Satan's purpose for this anxiety, he can take this change. He sees the change coming. He may not can stop the change, but he can stop you from accepting it properly. See, see Satan wants to do this. First, he wants to break our focus, keep us looking in the wrong direction. Saul was looking to the people. That was his final downfall. When, when God sent Samuel and said, we're taking the kingdom from your hand because you haven't done what God told you to do. And he said, well, I feared the people I fear what they thought. And so I try to do what the people said. And so God said, well, now your kingdom's gone. Well, I've had it. You've done enough. Now it's gone. So, so, so his problem was he was too busy watching people. Now, think about Samuel. Samuel and all this has got anxiety because he was watching Saul. Not God, Saul. Saul's not watching God. He's watching the people. Samuel's not watching God. Samuel's watching Saul. And so it just causes all these problems. Now, when God says it's over, then he tells Samuel to go, go to, to Jesse's house. Now he's anxious because he says, now, Saul finds out what's going on. He's going to kill me. So now, again, instead of keeping his eyes on God, he's got his eyes on Saul. If you're going to be the middleman, you cannot let your focus be broken. You've got to get in between and keep your eyes on God. If you take your eyes off God, anxiety all around Problems all around. The pain continues. And say, so say, first he wants to break our focus. Then he wants to break our stride, keep us from moving forward. See, he kept he kept Saul from moving forward because he was fearing the people and kept the sacrifices for himself instead of doing what God said. And Samuel himself, he didn't want to go forward to Jesse's house because he was afraid of what Saul was going to do. So his focus was broken and his trying to break his stride. And see, once all this starts happening, then you break your spirit. Because once you break your spirit, I've seen people with broken spirits, and, and when they've got their broken spirits, they, 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 they believe that there's no way they can get back on track. And as a matter of fact, I believe with all my heart, there's people here right now, you, you've suffered all these, and right now you're believing that there's no way that you can get back on track. And I'm here to tell you that's a lie from hell. God has something special for you today, especially if you're a middle man or a middle woman. All right? So now... How do we get back on track? How do we allow God to help us through our morning? How do we get back after we lost that job? How do we get back after we lost that relationship? How do we get back? Even me, how do I get back after losing my daughter? What do we do? I'm only going to do one, part of one today, and I'll do the rest of them next week. I want you to listen carefully. Because I was just telling, I was telling some of the guys, I may have told you I'm not sure. I'll tell you again if I, if I didn't. I was at Walmart one day. I was in there trying to get something uh, for my car. I was back in automotive. And I, was, I just picked up what I was going. I was trying to get out. Here comes this guy walking up to me. And he goes, how you doing? Since Bethany died. And I said, well, I said, I, I thank God that she's with him. I said, but it's hard hard to let go and it's hard to, to transition. You know, I said, I'd rather, I'd rather me suffer the pain of her leaving than her suffer the pain of staying. 
So, so that I got that, but I'm still in that fog, and I keep forgetting things, and I keep missing things, and and you know what he said? He said, "You shouldn't." I said, uh, "Excuse me." He said, "You should be over by now." And I said, "All right, why don't you go ahead and fill me in?" And he said, "Well, you pray to God. God takes it away, and you're fine." He said, matter of fact, you don't even know what warning is. I said, I don't. And he says, no. He said, I went to my, my daughter to court for three years. And he said, that's morning. He said, you don't know what morning is. I didn't want to tell him I went to Bethany for three years of court, too. I've done all that, too. I didn't tell him all that. I literally put my hands in my pockets. And I said, i got to go. And he said, uh, he said, no, you should be getting over this by now. You know, don't worry about it. You know, he was going on and on and on. I said, I told you I got to go. He followed me. And he followed me down another aisle. And I said, if he goes down one more aisle, me and him, we're going to have a greasy mess out here. <laughs> and I finally turned around and looked at him and I said, okay, everybody agrees in their own way. I really appreciate you trying to minister to me. Inside I was going, stop. Quit helping me. But outside of him, I smiled. I shook his hand and I said, I really have to go. And honestly, I want to take his hand and yank him right over there to the. I'm being honest. I mean, and instead, I said, I got to go. Thank you so much. Love you, brother. And, and I left. Got my car. My head leaked a little bit. But I said, okay, we got this. You and me, God, we got it. And so I. That is not any answer whatsoever. So now we're going to talk about the answer. That's why this was how this was all birth right here. All right. So now, how do you get past your broken focus and your broken stride and your broken spirit? After you've lost somebody, after you lost that job, after you whatever you've got, whatever the loss is in your life, sometimes it's just you've lost your confidence. Sometimes it's just you've lost your dreams. It doesn't have to be the death of somebody. It's just a loss in your life that's, that, that, that actually impacts you. So it's now. So now watch this. Here we go. Now, and let me get all the way through this thing because I don't want you to think I'm talking like that guy because that, that guy was so far off base and he and he almost, well, we'll leave that one. Okay. <laughs> almost. He almost didn't stop by the dentist. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
surgery, take it to the doctor and surgery, and they're trying to burn it out and didn't know it was a cancer, and they're trying to burn it out and burn it out, and there was there was there was three months there while they were playing with that little game, trying to burn it out. I could have had her being walked, taken care of at the cancer center, but no, no, so I had that what ifs. We had those what ifs all the time. So 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 how does that ever happen? What if I'd have done it different? And then there's that delay. Because now you sit back there with the leg because now you've lost energy. Especially if you're in a grieving cycle. You've lost energy and you've lost expectancy. And, you're, and, and so now you, you, got, you had a lot invested in that job, a lot invested in that relationship, a lot invested in your hopes and dreams. And, and you had a lot expected. And then all of a sudden it's taken away. And you're going, how did that happen? Where did it even come from? How, how did that happen? What if I'd have done different? And then as you're trying to get out of that fog, I call it fog. So, so, so now, now, get ready. When I said he had to get over it, God said, I want you to fill your horn with oil and go. You know what that told me? And he said, how are you going to mourn Saul? He was on his knees. He was stopped. He was not doing anything. He was stopped. And God said, fill your horn and go. That horn, again, is what he used to anoint what he used to help people, what he used to minister, it was empty. And God said, I need you to get filled back up again. And once you get filled back up again, I need you to step back in and do what I'm telling you to do. So, when I say get over it, I'm not saying you're going to be over it at all. I'm saying is you've got to get beyond. I should have used the word beyond, but I just wanted it right there for that because of what that guy told me. So now, so watch this. You can't change the past. But you can make adjustments in the present for a better future. What did it sink in for a minute? You can't change the past. All the what is, what, what if, you know, how that happened, all that stuff. You cannot change the past. But I can look at the past, I can learn from it, and I can make adjustments. So now I can get back up, I can let God fill me again, and I can let God cause me to be energized so that I can get out and do what God's got me doing. So now, so now watch this. Get over it. How do you get over it? Because watch this. Sometimes the loss is too great. The connection is too strong. The cut is too deep. Some of y'all are looking at it now and you're thinking, you know what? That's where I'm at. Loss is too great, it's too strong to whatever it was I lost. And the cut is way, way too deep. This is what I was trying to tell that guy that day. There are times you can't get over it. You learn to deal with it. I will never get over Beth and Lynn. I never, I never get over all those court cases. I'll never get over watching her when she was a little bitty thing. And and trying to teach her to quit beating her, beating her doll babies up because that's what she was used to. And working with her and going through all that for, 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 for 18 years, we had her in some kind of therapy or something all the time trying to get over some of this stuff that she was going through. And so, 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 and, and then her coming and loving on me, even in the worst of times, she'd come up and she'd grab me and she'd say, come on, Dad. Or she would grab me on the shoulder and she'd say, I love you, Dad. And I hadn't heard that since November 17th. I haven't felt that little, well, not little embrace. You know how she was. She squeezed you and hugged. And I haven't felt that. And so some things you never get over, you learn to deal with it. All right? So I said, we really close. This is what I've learned over the last few months. God is God. He knows what he's doing. When you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Just a couple of days ago, I heard Bethany in the house. I walked to see where she was at. I heard her. I heard her. She wasn't there. Every day I walk by her urn, sitting right there, I walk by her urn. And I say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna not feel. I'm gonna feel. I'm gonna get through this. And the only way to get through this, I got 
have to accept and learn to deal with it. So I walked by her urn and now she got the Emmaus bell that she stole. Y'all in Emmaus know all about stealing the bells. <laughs> she stole the bell, they gave it to us. And now it's by her urn. Now if I see that bell, and before the whole song was the urn, it really caused a lot of pain. Now I go by and see that bell, and now I kind of chuckle. Said the preacher's daughter was the one who stole the bell. Oh. <laughs> they even asked me, they said, why is it, why the preacher's daughter steal the bell? Why, why? I said, well, don't you know all the preachers, the kids? I said, they're like they are because we've been playing with the deacon's kids. And of course, got a big laugh, and they just gave us the bell, said, here, you know, you can have it. So, again, God is God. He knows what he's doing. When you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. You see, here's what Satan tries to get you to stop doing. When you're in this spot right here, you're in the middle, he tries to get you to stop praying. Thinking God's forsaken you, God's left you, God is no longer interested in you. No, you got to keep praying. You got to keep talking to Him. But not only do you need to keep talking to Him, you need to keep listening to Him. Because once you pray, the number one way the number one way He talks to you when you pray is through His Word. And so, if you're not studying His Word, you're not hearing what He's saying. Even if He's talking to you, sometimes He talks to you in your spirit. Sometimes he talks to you through circumstances. Sometimes he talks to you through songs. Whatever. These things are coming, but they always have to line up with his word. If it doesn't line up with his word, then it may not be God talking to you. Like these guys go along and kill somebody and say, God told me to do that. I just don't know. Nah, don't believe that. Okay. Talk to him. Pray. Listen to him. His word. And trust him. Now you're walking by faith. You know, when I jumped out of the airplane, I told you all this, some of you all this, you've heard it. When I jumped out of the airplane at 11,000 feet, I told the guy, I said, I don't want to jump out, I want to flip out, I want to flip. He said, ain't no problem. He had had 11,000 jumps or something. So he gets out there and he tells me to slide my foot out. And I slide my foot out before I even realized it. I didn't think, I thought he would say go or something. He didn't say anything. He said, slide your foot, slide your foot, slide your foot. And 150 mile an hour wind is coming up against me. And I'm feeling that. And all of a sudden I look out. And when I look out, there we go. It's that word, reason wind. And we're flipping. And while we're flipping, we finally get back straight again. And I looked and I saw the airplane leaving. And only as, as normal, just a normal reaction, I reached out to grab something. You know, 11,000 feet, you can't even grab a cloud. <laughs> and so I went, there's nothing to grab. And so then, after I'm looking for something to grab, then I notice something else. Not only do I feel totally helpless because there's nothing to grab, I feel totally weightless because I don't even feel the pressure. I'm just flying through the air. As I'm flying through the air, the guy's talking to me, and we're flying. It didn't dawn on me until this sermon when Peter jumped out of the boat. He was the middle man. Did you know that? He was the middle man between Jesus and the other disciples. He jumps out of the boat. And while he's walking on water, there's nothing to grab. And he's totally weightless. And he's going across the water. And as he begins to pay attention to the storms around him, he starts thinking. My challenge for you today, and we're going to finish this next week, and I hope this has really, really brought some healing. And again, this is just the start. I, the next week is going to be even better. The middle man, you're out of the boat. You're out of the plane. You're totally weightless. You've got nothing to grab a hold of. You're totally helpless. All you got to do now, the only thing 
I could do when I was out of that plane was the guy was strapped to me behind me and he was talking in my ear. So I had to trust the voice from above. He said, now, I want you to put your arms back. And then we flew like a jet. He said, I want you to put your arms out. I put my arms out. <laughs> DC and Daniel said, we heard like you jumped out of the plane, dude. The only thing I could holler was glory. Glory. <laughs> it's a daddy, you look kind of retarded, but they're going, glory, glory, glory. <laughs> Some of y'all jumped out of that plane right now. Some of y'all got out of that boat. Some of y'all are walking in the spot where you're trying to figure out what God is doing. God, what's going on here? Why? Why am I going through this morning, this season of mourning? God, why was this taken away from me? God, why now am I going to have to have a new start? And why does this new start? Because I promise you, when you're in that season of mourning, you don't think about the new start. All you think about is your past. You look at the rearview mirror. Not, you don't look through the windshield, you look into the rearview mirror. I looked in the rearview mirror. Just the other day I went somewhere, and I, I, oh, we were uh, uh, at the airport taking those kids, those sick kids, and they were getting on airplanes and helicopters. And so Linda and I were there, and we were, we were taking them and, and helping them get on the planes and stuff. And, and all of a sudden, this, this Cushman comes by, and it's loaded down with people, and the person on the back had their back turned to me, and it looked just... And she thought she was going to fall off and look just like Bethany. And the first thing I said was, she, Bethany's going to do it again. She's going to fall off. And I said, wait a minute, she's not even here. And then my heart hurt. Last night, we were at a high school thing, I mean, uh, at high school, where Bethany used to sing up on stage all the time. She was in, that, in, she was in the singing, and she would sing. And, and, uh, and, and so we were watching the little recital for a grand young up there, but all I could see was Bethany up there singing. And then, then one of the girls doing the song started playing and it, and it said, I will carry you, I will carry you. And that's what Linda used to sing to Bethany every night when she went to bed. I will carry you, I will carry you. And so there I go, you get your head leaking in a recital. But you know what? That's all part of the healing process. Keep your focus. God's got this. God's got this. I wore some more of these bracelets. But instead of saying, God's got this, Team Bethany, I says, Team Bethany, God's got this. But I ordered another set. It says, God's got this. Her two sayings. And then the other saying, Either way, I win. You know, it may not make a difference to some people, but it sure makes a difference to me. Be able to look down there and see that because I hear her voice every time. So look, there's some things you'll never get over. You learn how to deal with, but you deal with it not by letting go of God, not by looking in the rearview mirror. You got to look in the forward, but you got to look in the windshield. There's a reason why the windshield is a hundred times bigger than the rearview mirror because what's in the past is in the past. What's ahead is unlimited. In the past, it's limited. You, whatever happened, that happened. It's limited. That big wish was up here because in the future it's unlimited. And the scope is humongous. If I could leave you with anything right now. Brandon, I want you to come here and scrum something for it, bro. You're going to do fine. Look at you. Happy birthday. And it's proud. we got to sing happy birthday to Brandon, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> Where's some pennies you can drop? <laughs> we'll sing happy birthday to him after we have our armor call. How about that? <laughs> I wish I looked that good when I turned 25. Okay. My challenge to you today, just like God was telling Samuel, quit looking in the rearview mirror and start looking through the windshield. All that Saul was was great, it was wonderful, but now that's gone. I'm going to do a new thing. I'm even going to change the playing field. I'm going to change the paradigm. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. What about you saying? Every head bowed, every eye closed.
I'm going to ask, is there anybody here? Well, nobody's looking around. Every eye's closed. Is there anybody here that does not know Jesus as your personal Savior? We just lift that hand up because I'm going to pray right now. We're going to pray the prayer of salvation. Is there anybody here like that? Secondly, is there anybody here that you once had a strong hold in the hand of God and now you've let go and it's not as strong as it used to be and you want it to get back the way it was. You want to rededicate yourself. Would you just, real quickly, nobody's looking, would you just slide that hand up? We're going to pray this together, all of us together. Ready? Let's pray it together. Lord, Lord, I love you. And I thank you for all you've done in my life. I thank you for the strength and the courage that you have given me over the years. I need, one more time, God, you to strengthen me. And I need you to touch me as I rededicate my life to you. And I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus. Now, now maybe you're here. And you're suffering loss. It might not be a physical loss. It might not be a relationship. It could be just a dream. It could be a hope. It could be something. But you're experiencing a loss. And you're trying to cope with it. And you're needing God give you that extra boost so you can take your eyes out of the rearview mirror and put them in the windshield. And I'm speaking to you right now. Nobody looking around, every eye closed. Am I speaking to you? That's you. Would you put that hand up? Put that hand up.
Please come up and pray. Feel, please feel free to come up and pray. But I just felt it was too important. Too important. I wanted to get you in your seat right where you were and pray with you. Next week we're going to talk about even more. We're going to go deeper. But just remember, for the rest of the week, I want you to remember this. Remember this. I need, say this for the rest of the week, y'all say this. I need your help, God, to quit looking in the rearview mirror and start looking through the windshield. For what ahead of me is greater than what was behind me. And I thank you for this change. Amen. Isn't God good? Oh, God. Now, now he, said, he said he didn't want to do it real fast. We're not going to know we're doing it. Okay, ready? We're not going to let him know we're doing this. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Brandon. Happy birthday to you. Isn't God good? Oh, yeah. Next week, come on back. We're going to do part two of this. And there's some more coming about this. I'm telling you, uh, and this stuff is honestly, I, I, it's, it's not just something from a book. Okay, it is from his book, but it's also from something piping in all of us right now. I really believe the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to us as we're trying to move forward instead of backwards. Amen? Amen. Give somebody a high five again. Tell me. It's, 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 you're glad to see him today.